here. Um, I just since this is sort of the end of our, we've actually had a physics conference that's gone on in this uh, beautiful venue. So I just want to. This light is killing me. Can somebody lower that light, please, a little bit? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I just want to thank Belen Gavella for organizing this amazing conference where we get to have um, artists and scientists come together in this audience and on this stage. It's an art historian. It's really quite lovely. Um, I also want to uh, say how wonderful it is to be on a panel with all these particular people because I've um, had, had a, a lovely experience of, of meeting all of them before. Um, Fabiola and I, of course, have been going way back talking physics. Um, back before she was big director. <laughs> when she was just someone really interested in everything going on. It's fantastic. Uh, Hitoshi I've known for a long time. And of course, Linda is very funny because the last time Linda and I were, I think, on a panel together was the, f the first anniversary of Einstein, which is the Einstein, uh, the, it's a celebration of the 100th anniversary of special relativity. And this is 2015, which is the celebration of the 100th anniversary of general relativity. So that's also a lot of fun. And Mary and I um, were on a panel not so long ago discussing his book. So this is really kind of fun for me. Hopefully it's fun for you too. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm gonna um, put together some ideas about physics and some idea ideas about um, using physics to inspire some art projects. I mean, it's one of the things that was really fun about working on an extra dimension of space in addition to the many physics ideas that it opened up. It actually opens up a lot of ideas for, in, the, in, in the art realm. And of course, we saw a lot of that already. And I'll tell you a little bit about my um, meager participation in this. But I think it's just, it's an interesting venue in which to think about directions in which to go uh, once you're thinking about physics in, a, and trying to use it in art. And I just want to remind you, as everyone knows, I think art is a way, to, is a reflection on society, it's a reflection on the kinds of things we think about. And a lot of us are thinking about physics these days, and a lot of importance goes into not just physics, but other types of sciences. And it's part of our culture, so I think it makes sense that we should be incorporating it into the art world now. So I should warn you, this is the first time I've put together the slides in this particular way, so I don't actually know what's going to be on the next slide. Oh, I'm on a blind spot. Okay. Okay, I was told that corner was bad. I didn't know there were... Somewhere in the middle. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, so there's many new results in theoretical physics today. I should point there. Okay. Okay. I have to look there and point here. Okay. Okay. Um, many possibilities for what's out there in the universe. I think some of the most interesting do involve the idea of an extra dimension of space. And, um, you know, it could be actually something that we discover um, in the next few years at CERN at the Large Hadron Collider. And I'll tell you a little bit about why we might be able to do that. But I'll also tell you about um, implications for ways of thinking about the world, both in science and in music and in art. But I'm going to start with a really strange slide, which is going to make you wonder why I'm starting with this slide. Um, I think all of you recognize this as um, Paris. And we see the Eiffel Tower in the background. We see a kiosk on the right-hand side. <coughs> we see a boulevard, which is always usually full of more cars than this. Um, but the reason I'm telling you this is because what I want you to do is for a moment, and this is something that, as we'll see, reflects in themes in art as well, and it certainly is an important theme in science, to think about the fact that the way you see that Eiffel Tower, actually how you look at it matters. The resolution, the scale with which you look at it is very important. It, if you looked at it from too far away, you wouldn't even know that the Eiffel Tower was there. And if you looked at it very closely, you'd see the beautiful iron work. And if you looked for it even more closely, you'd notice that it was made up of iron atoms. But to see the way we see it, we're looking at a particular resolution at a particular scale. And it's such an obvious thought, but it really helps you understand what we're doing in physics today when we try to explore smaller and smaller scales and when we try to go to larger scales. It's not that the world changes, but how we see the world changes. It's our perspective on what we can observe and what we learn from it. But the real reason I showed you that slide was not to tell you that, but to, to, because if you look back on that poster, it was actually an advertisement for our opera, which, <laughs> which premiered at the Pompidou Center. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, by going, so by looking at a higher resolution, you can see that my name is on it. <laughs> so it's funny. <laughs> Someone actually sent me the slide. That's why I have it, the picture. Okay. 
So, so I'm going to talk a little bit just to talk about physics and scale, just to set some context. Um, and that's going to be relevant for when I talk about the art exhibit we did. And I'm also going to tell you a little bit about extra dimensional space. And hopefully I'll have time to cover some of this material. Okay. But the first thing I want you to know, you don't have to read all of this. The first thing I just want you to think about is that we're human beings. We see at a particular scale. And you know, I, I think this is, you know, we all live in the world of elementary particle physics or cosmology. We're used to small and big scales and it's just the venue we have it. But one of the really interesting things for me about when I started to write and talk to the public was how mysterious all these scales seem. And that's because they're not scales that you encounter in your daily life. And by scale, I mean length or I mean energy. They're not things that you see every day. That doesn't mean they don't exist. It's a statement about us. It's not a statement about the universe or about the world. And we as physicists are trying to get around those limitations that are imposed by being us human beings, taking advantage of the fact that we're us human beings as well, as Mario pointed out in the beginning also. So we're trying to do both of those things. And the physical universe involves a huge range of scales, which is far greater than anything we can just see with our naked eye. So just to set the context, let's just take a very brief tour of what's out there in the universe to understand a little bit what we're doing today. So we'll start with large scales, because we've talked about that a little bit already. So there's the scale of the, so just to recognize what I'm doing, notice at the bottom there's a human being. A human being is about a meter or two tall, right? And it's not coincidence that we say a meter as our unit because that's the unit we're very comfortable with. It's about the length of our arm. It's, just, it's a comfortable size. The universe, however, at least the universe that we can see is much bigger. It's 10 to the 27th meters. That's 10 multiplied by itself 27 times. It's an enormous universe that we live in. And of course the universe itself can be infinite, but we're talking about the universe that we can see. The universe that we can see given that it has a finite lifetime, 13.8 billion years, and the speed of light is finite. So with that, that's telling us we can see out to a certain amount in the universe, but, and that's what, we call, what I'm calling the visible universe, the known universe. And within that, we have a whole bunch of other stuff. We have galaxies of 10 to the 20th meters, we have solar system 10 to the 13th meters. Um, we have all these different scales. But the thing that I want you to keep in mind is that that's an enormous range of scales, but the same laws of physics apply over that entire range of scales. We've discovered many new objects, many new things. Every time we look more deeply out into the universe, more carefully with higher resolution, we discover new stuff. But we haven't really discovered new laws of physics. We've just discovered new stuff. However, that's fairly different from what happens when we look at small scales. So, um, so now on this slide, we have a human being at the top, right? A human being, the meter scale is at the top now. So everything, is, everything in this slide is smaller than a meter. And I start off actually with some biological stuff to remind you that, you know, to find out even how our own bodies work, not just abstract elementary particles, but even our own bodies, we didn't know anything until we really looked inside. We didn't know about the circulatory system until bodies were cut open and we saw arteries and veins and understood the working of the heart. We didn't understand red blood cells until we looked under a microscope and actually saw them. And we, of course, didn't really know the structure of DNA until we had X-ray diffraction to be able to figure that out as well, to figure out the helical structure. So even for things that seem as fundamental to us as our own bodies, we, unless you actually look inside, you don't see what's there. And it's certainly true in the world of physics, that until we looked at smaller scales, no one guessed what was there. And, um, and of course, we're, we're a theorist, well, I'm a theorist, some of us are experimenters, some of us are theorists here or here. Some of us are observers looking at large scales. We have a wide range of people here. But as a theorist, I'd like to understand what's at these smaller scales. I'll try to make guesses for what's at those smaller scales, but I know that until people actually look, like Fabiola and her colleagues, um, we won't know what's there. And so that's why it's so incredibly important that we actually study these smaller scales to test which of these many ideas are right. So I'll tell you an idea that we've had, but we won't know if it's correct until an experiment actually verifies the consequences of that particular theory. And so just going down in scales, um, we, we have a whole bunch of scales. I'm not going to go through all of them here. Um, but I just want to remind you that no one would have known about quantum mechanics until we really studied the atom, until we actually were able to probe down into those scales of the atom. I mean, the atom, after all, the, the original meaning was supposed to be something that was um, unchanging and un indivisible. Yet the way we found out about atoms was precisely because they change, they radiate, and because they can be divided. They have electrons surrounding nuclei. So all of the structure we find as we've explored smaller and smaller scale. 
And today we're probing the, the frontier is the Large Hadron Collider, labeled there as LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. And you heard a little bit about that earlier. And that's um, a giant underground ring where protons are accelerated to collide together to make, hopefully make new stuff that tells us about even smaller scales, 10 to the minus 19th meters or 10 to the minus 17th centimeters. And one can consider going even further down in scale, but that's beyond the realm of experiment and I'm not going to talk about it today. Oh, dead spot. And this is just to say, I'm not going to go through all these details, but every one of these scales we saw something really significant. We saw an atom, we saw a nucleus, we see quarks inside a nucleus. All of these things were not known until we actually went and, lo and looked with experiments. Theorists proposed some of these ideas, in particular the idea of something like a quark was proposed, but it was essential to actually measure this in experiments to know about it. Skip that, skip that. What are we going to learn? We're going to learn quite a lot. We already answered one of the questions, which is how particles acquire their masses at a fundamental level, and that has to do with the discovery of the Higgs boson and the Higgs mechanism. Again, I don't have time to talk about that here, but it's an amazing victory for the Large Hadron Collider that in the first operation of the machine, they found the Higgs boson, which really was a target. But the other things we'd like to understand are what explains the weakness of gravity. Another way of asking that question is why are masses what they are? Why are they as low as they are? in some sense. Um, and we don't know the answer to that question. And that's a big question that we really think this is the right energy to be looking at. And it turns out the answers to this question that people have thought of all seem to be rather exotic. Um, you either need an extension of the symmetry of space and time, the symmetries that tell you things are the same in all directions, all times. It seems you have to extend that symmetry into the quantum regime. That's one possibility. Another possibility is actually having an extra dimension itself. And another thing the Large Hadron Collider is looking for is dark matter. So there's many exciting things that could be on the horizon, and we're hoping to learn more about them. Um, I'm going to skip over this. I'm just going to say that um, one of the things we know, because I'm going to talk about an extra dimension, it's, and because this is the year that of Einstein's theory of general relativity, I just want to remind you that um, gravity is essentially connected to the nature of space and time. Um, the, in some sense, you can understand gravity from the effect of sp on space and time of whatever it is that exerts a gravitational force. And you can ask how things respond to that gravitational force. But the thing I want you to keep in mind is that his theory didn't actually specify how many dimensions of space there are. This is drawn, we have sort of a two-dimensional distorted surface here. We live in three dimensions, but maybe there are more dimensions, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a moment. Okay. So what do we mean by dimensions? What are dimensions of space? Well, I think most of us are familiar with three dimensions of space. I think that would be fair to say. You might have an X, Y, and Z axis. You can think of it as up, down, forward, backward, left, right. But actually, we don't know if there are other dimensions of space. Now, of course, you might say, well, how could there be other dimensions of space? We've never seen them. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to start off by talking about the fact that you need to get to smaller scales to see a lot of the new physics, a lot of things that are happening that aren't evident. I mean, even atoms are not obvious at the scale at which we exist now, but none of us doubt that atoms exist. Um, and in the same way, it could be that there are dimensions of space that are for some reason invisible to us at the scales we look at, but when we look at higher energies, in some sense smaller distances, maybe we could see the effect of these other dimensions of space. Now, of course, that's a very um, abstract notion, so I'm going to try to give you a little bit of an idea of what I mean by extra dimensions, but um, keep in mind that I also cannot picture an additional dimension. I can think about it mathematically, I can think about it in words and abstractions, but actually, trying to picture it is beyond most of us, and that's why it's, it's kind of fun to see what artists do with this idea. So, um, so there was a really lovely book called Flatland that was written, um, I guess, in the 19th century um, by Edwin A. Abbott. Um, I like saying Edwin A. Abbott because the narrator was a square, which is, those of you who are mathy people will think is funny, which I guess are not very many. Uh, um, but in any case, um, the idea was that to have a creature that lived in two dimensions of space and couldn't picture a third dimension. 
So they're the analog of us, right? We already live in three dimensions. We don't know what a fourth dimension would look like. And so Edwin A. Abbott asked the question, what would a third dimension look like to a flatlander, someone who lived in two dimensions? And so they said, like, what would happen as the sphere went through flatland? What would happen as the sphere passed through? And what would you see? You'd see a series of disks that grew in size and then decreased in size. So you'd see two-dimensional slices. You'd never see the sphere in its entirety, but if you followed it over time, you would be able to put together the fact that you had indeed a sphere. And in the same way, we don't picture, we would not be able to see a tesseract and we would not be able to see a four-dimensional sphere, but if something passed through, we would see three-dimensional slices, if you like. And over time, we'd be able to put together what we had and figure out that that was a higher dimensional object. In reality, that's not the way we're going to discover extra dimensions if, if they, indeed they exist. Um, but this is one way of picturing what it would mean to have an additional dimension. Oops, just going in the wrong place. Okay. Um, and I just, for fun, uh, since this is an evening lecture in a museum, I would just remind you that art, of course, always plays with dimension in some sense. I mean, that's one of the things that's happening in art. Um, you're trying to capture three-dimensional images and two-dimensional surfaces or extract um, higher dimensional. Even if we're not going to extra dimensions, we're always playing with even three versus two dimensions at the very least when we're doing art. And so I think this was mentioned earlier, but we have uh, Salvador Dali's, like, oh, this is supposed to be a, a hypercube, um, which is kind of fun. Uh, and this is just random examples of trying to play with dimensions and trying to get as much information as you can onto that two-dimensional surface so that you can come back with the information of what was there in three dimensions. And so, so how do we think about extra dimensions? Well, I already mentioned slices. Another way you can do it is through projections, by projecting different dimensions. And if you think about it in terms of medical stuff, if you do slices, that's a bit like taking a CAT scan. If you do projections, it's like doing... Um, Sorry, it's like doing an MRI. If you do a CAT scan, it's like putting together different x-ray images and that you have different projections that you can then reproduce what you have. There's just many different ways to think about it. But I just want to remind you again that don't try to picture it. But this is my favorite projection. Okay, extra dimensions in physics. I believe Linda already talked about this as a couple others. Um, Kluts have proposed the idea of an extra dimension in 1919. It's actually interesting. Einstein was actually the referee and delayed the publication of this for a, two year, a couple of years. And it was because he said, it's an interesting idea, but like, what's different about this extra dimension? You said, you know, it was a, real, it was a nice idea. It was the goal was to unify what, the two known forces at the time, electromagnetism and gravity. But it actually um, wasn't clear, like, what should make this other dimension different? And the answer was that the extra dimension can be rolled up to a tiny size, and that answer was provided by Klein. So when we talk about particles from an extra dimension, we talk about kaluza klein particles, something that will come up later on. I also want to mention that there's also a new answer that my collaborator Raman Sundram and I came up with having to do with brains. So we'll come up to that. Um, but what Klein said is something rather intuitive. Well, it's intuitive in a sense. You have to acknowledge that you're thinking about an extra dimension first. But the idea is that maybe you have an extra dimension that's curled up to a really tiny size. Right, so you have an extra dimension, but it's not big the way our infinite dimensions are, our very large dimensions. Maybe there's a dimension that's curled up. So you could have, here we have, again, a lower dimensional analogy, but if you imagine a two-dimensional surface that gets rolled up into a cylinder, if you look at that from very far away or if you have rolled up very tightly, it would look one-dimensional, even though the cylinder itself is started off as a two-dimensional surface. So the way, again, we're back to this idea of your resolution matters, right? If you look at it, <coughs> very closely, of course, you can see that if you're a tiny bug crawling on it, you can see that there are two dimensions. But if you're not, if you're looking at very coarse resolution, you might think that this is a one-dimensional object. So in some sense, it's a very intuitive notion. If that dimension is so small, it's smaller than anything you can see, how would you know it exists? And that's basically what physics tells us. If something's too small for us to observe, we might as well assume it's not there. But once we get to the scales where we can see it, it becomes a real part of our universe. And one of the exciting things, of th reasons to think about an extra dimension of space is maybe it actually helps resolve some of the problems that we have in standard <coughs> particle physics theory if that extra dimension does not exist. So in 1999, my collaborator Raman Sundram and I 
thought of a different way that extra dimensions might hide, and it's based on a notion that's called brains, B-R-A-N-E. Um, it's a word that's like membrane, and it's a surface. So it's like that you can have, <laughs> no chance. <laughs> it's like you can have a surface in an extra dimension. Um, and they play an essential role in string theory. And if you think about it, it's a lower dimensional surface on which particles or stuff can live. So it's a little bit, to, to make an analogy, like water drops on a shower curtain that can live on the two-dimensional surface. Even though there's three dimensions of space, those, those droplets only experience the two dimensions. And in the same way, maybe we and forces and everything in nature also lives on a lower dimensional surface, maybe a three-dimensional surface in a higher dimensional space. And um, the one thing that doesn't live on that surface, though, will always be gravity. Gravity is connected to all of the dimensions of space. And that's really important, because if we just had something that didn't interact with the higher dimensions at all, as physicists, we wouldn't care it exists. But the fact that gravity extends into those extra dimensions is really important to us. So I'm just going to mention, and this is kind of mathy looking, but I just want to mention that one of the biggest problems we have in particle physics today is known as the hierarchy problem. I mentioned a number of scales before. Um, one of the scales that's relevant is called the weak scale. It's the scale at which the Large Hadron Collider is operating. It's the scale at which we discovered the Higgs boson. And the other scale is called the Planck scale, which is enormously higher. It's 16 orders of magnitude higher. And one of the biggest questions in particle physics is why are these two scales so different? The Planck scale has to do with the scale at which gravity becomes a strong force. The weak scale has to do with the scale at which elementary particles acquire their masses. And it's not just a, like, we don't understand the answer. If we write down our theory, it looks almost inconsistent to have these scales be so different. And it's actually only by a fudge, or what we call a fine-tuning, that we actually get the theory to work. No one believes there's this fudge, and we really think there's something fundamentally interesting going on here. And one of those ideas might be an extra dimension of space. And so the theory that Raman Sundram and I came up with to address this issue had to do with the existence of two brains, not just one brain in an extra dimension. So there was um, one brain, which I'm calling the gravity brain here, another one which I call the weak brain. That's the one in which we live. So we live in this region. And the idea is that gravity actually varies as you go from one dimension to the other. That wasn't just an assumption. It actually was a solution to Einstein's theory of, of equations of gravity. And when we did that, we found that gravity changes dramatically as you go from one place to the other. Or another way of thinking about it is that masses change dramatically. So rather than living in a world where we would have expected those scales to be the similar, the Planck scale and the weak scale, we live in a world where we actually expect it to be exponentially <coughs> smaller. And um, I'm going to say one more piece of physics, and then I'm just going to give some art that came out of this. So, but I just want to say one of the reasons we care about this theory is because it's something we can test. We can test this at the Large Hadron Collider. And the test is, in particular, it's really that when we collide together protons, we can produce this Kaluza Klein particle. It's a particle that actually has momentum in the extra dimension of space. And what's very exciting about the particular theory that Raman and I wrote down is that that particle would decay into normal particles that we know about. And that is how high energy particles are discovered. It's how the Higgs boson was discovered. It's how all new particles are discovered at these colliders. Is that you produce them, they exist for a short time, they decay into stuff that we can see. And this is just to say that Fabiola and I were both there. <laughs> Fabiola's there a lot. I'm not there very often. Okay. So I just wanted to give a couple of examples of how I, I personally was involved in a couple of projects to think about the applications of this in art. And one thing was I co-curated an, an art exhibit on the theme of scale. And it was a lot of fun. I did it with an artist. It actually was a really nice experience. It's, um, it's called the Los, Los Angeles Art Association. Uh, they have a gallery in Los Angeles. It's really wonderful. And we worked together with the artists where they tried to, to, to actually implement this idea that, that things can look different at different scales. And the art was all over the place. It wasn't anything that was necessarily derived from physics. But it was just this notion that how, what kind of scale you look at something matters. And I'll just, I'm running out of time, so I'll just run through a few of them, but feel free to ask anything you want. So we called it Measure for Measure, and we had a bunch of artists who participated. This was actually a, a tree that was put together from, it was a giant redwood tree that was put together from many small individual ones where you could really see the, the different shape of the bark up close. It's a little bit reminiscent of the Eiffel Tower picture I showed you in the beginning. Um, 
Katrina McElroy did something called Compounded, which was really, I really loved her, her piece. It was something that looks like a pop art exhibit from far away, but if you look up close, each of those is actually a, a frozen in time moment of, some, of a facial expression. She actually had a video, she froze them in time and used those to make the, the exhibit. So it's really something very different. And in fact, it sort of took the theme even a step further, saying that you know, the way your memory works is that again, you sort of have these moments that you preserve that are part of some bigger picture. So it was really very thoughtful and, and beautiful. Um, Felicity Nove actually did something much more um, physics inspired. That's the one on the back wall. And Ms. Sampei Yang actually did something that was much more biologically inspired. And Susan Cerrone did something called, she called Altered Book, which I just love because I love these books. But she, she took books like Alice in Wonderland and she actually carved them out into that, to put together all the pictures that were there um, into some sort of composite. So this is actually a composite of an actual book where she's carved it to, to create these images. It's really quite beautiful. And so, the one, and so I now we'll return to the opera, which was really a great experience. When, after I wrote my first book, War Passages, um, a composer named Hector Parra contacted me and said that he was interested in doing an opera based on some scientific theme and he'd read my book and thought it would be really interesting to sort of use this as the idea of an extra dimension both sort of metaphorically and also physically to, as, as a way, as an opportunity to explore creativity and also the idea of, uh, he's an electronic composer to, to have sort of an extra, extra dimensional uh, kind of voice as well. So I'm just gonna show you a few slides and some excerpts and hopefully the sound will work. Showing the two characters, one in a lower dimension, one in a higher dimension. And we had the, this was premiered in the Pompidou Center, which is why we had the slide was from Paris. And it was really interesting because we had to figure out what to do with the orchestra. We had the ensemble into Contemporain, they were wonderful, but we basically had the screen and they were behind the screen. Because it wasn't actually, an, there was no place to place it otherwise. And she's exploring another dimension. He's stuck in three dimensions. Uh, Hector insisted on an equation, so there's an equation. And here they're trying to reconcile the way you would see something in an experiment where you would actually explore the other dimension and someone who can just sort of see that information from a, a lower dimensional point of view. So I'll just end there. Um, and just to say, um, this is a picture that I love from the tape, which I think expresses the beauty of extra dimensions in some odd way, um, uh, is that there's hidden riches in the universe. And what I didn't know when I actually saw this, which I should have known, is that the, that's the Chateau de Sion, which is very close to CERN, and that clearly is not a coincidence. So thank you.